All right, folks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I uh, hope you enjoyed the first half of the day. Had a good lunch. Uh, we're about to kick off our next session here with Mike Kottmeyer and the 10 Steps to Becoming a Great Agile Coach. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Excellent. Hey, how are you guys all doing today? Um, I guess you can't actually answer me on that, so you can just silently tell me you're all doing awesome or something like that. Um, it's, a, it's actually a little weird doing a talk like this um, totally remote because, you know, you're so used to, like, being in the room and, and being able to thrive. Oh, wow, way to go, everybody. I see Bill, I see a few other folks. That's awesome, very cool. Um, so thank you guys for turning on cameras and, and letting me look at you. So, um, so this was a talk that, that I, I started thinking about doing last year. We did it up at Agile and Beyond up in Detroit. Uh, Rachel Howard and I, Rachel's my chief cultural officer and does all the people stuff um, for leading Agile. And what this talk really is, it's, it's about um, the, the attributes and the things that you need to think about when, um, when you think about how to develop yourself and your skill set um, in agile coaching, right? And the story, the fundamental story that I'm going to kind of tell you guys is really around what, what we've done at Leading Agile and over the last 10 years, how we've evolved kind of our hiring and development um, and the way that we think about how to slot people in to different engagements and, and what the strengths are and, and what weaknesses are and what people are good at and what they're not good at and how to think about it. And so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about our story. And then, and then ideally the takeaway would be um, things that you guys can go do depending upon really like what you want to be candidly when you grow up. Cause as like, I mean, you guys know, I mean, I imagine, I think I saw from the keynote this morning that probably half the audience are, are people that consider themselves agile coaches. And so, and so like, and that doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. So, so I tend to approach things from a, from an exploratory perspective. Um, I tend not to take the disposition that like I've got all the answers or it's, it's a formula. Um, it's more just a, a list of things that um, you guys might want to consider. Oh, let me see if I can actually get my tech working. There we go. Cool. So my marketing team set this up for me. If you guys would like this deck, um, you can uh, text 10 steps to 33777 and uh, get instant access to that. That is available to you now if you guys would like to do that. And so, so the first thing that I want to talk about a little bit are what I would consider like the, what's called the, the four primary skill areas that, that, that make a great coach. So if you think about it, right, the first aspect of, of coaching is really um, largely around skills transfer. And so you think about skills transfer in the context of like, can I teach somebody how to write a user story? Or can I teach somebody how to facilitate a retrospective or do a burn down chart or run a PI planning meeting or, um, you know, just any of the number of things that we might want to do. But my belief is, is that skills are actually only a part of what um, it takes to become a great agile coach. Knowing Scrum, knowing Safe, whatever, that's only part of it. The other part may be um, overcoming resistance. So it's one thing to know how to do something, but it's another thing to be able to help somebody else understand how to do it. Because if you might imagine, right, so people come in and maybe they've come out of a waterfall world or they've come out of some other kind of agile environment. It's maybe a little different than the agile environment that you've been in. And so if you're saying, hey, I think we should do it this way. And they say, well, why isn't the way that I was doing it before good enough? There's, there's a bit of empathy and understanding that you have to be able to, to connect with them where they are. And you have to be able to influence them to get them to do the things that you might need them to do, to, to try to get out of their comfort zone. So it's not just about knowing how to do it. It's about being able to help them understand and, and overcome their resistance to wanting to be able to do it. So it's different than just knowing, it's helping them understand why. And then I think as you get into more transformational coaching, right? Because that's kind of a thing. We have the idea of maybe team level coaching or product coaching. We have the idea of um, transformational coaching. We have to have the ability to be able to lead change, right? So you think about what's involved in being able to lead change, right? We have the idea of <clears throat> how do we create safety? How do we set vision? 
How do we um, implement communication strategies? How do we help people understand how to take baby steps and run experiments and try things and pivot, right? And so anytime you're doing transformation, you have to think about how we wanna lead change. And then the, maybe the fourth category that we would tend to look at would be things around how do you set direction? How do you get leadership alignment? How do you communicate where you're going and how you're gonna get there? <clears throat> I suspect at this stage of our maturity as a community, most people understand that it's not just about um, you know, doing the agile things, right? We talk about the difference between doing agile and being agile. So if we're gonna be an agile organization, like what does that actually look like? And then how are we going to move people to get there and what are we gonna point them towards? Okay, so what I, where I, where I put this slide in was just because I just want to like level set on terms of what I, what I mean by coaching. There's the skills transfer, there's the helping people overcome resistance, leading change, and setting direction. Okay, so with that as our backdrop, I'm going to start telling you guys the story about how we've evolved um, a bit as a company in terms of like how we were looking at people. And it's not immediately obvious from this deck the way that I constructed it. But when we very first started, um, Leading Agile has been around for about 10 years now. And probably the first couple of years, you know, as, as you guys might imagine, you know, I'm fairly well connected in the Agile community and we would just hire people that we knew and people that we liked. Um, and, and I don't mean that in like a, like a ad hoc way. I mean, these were all people that were fairly present in the Agile community. They were out doing speaking. They were, had been working as Agile coaches someplace. But the criteria for us was largely, do they, do they have solid Agile skills? And do they, um, and, you know, do, they just know, do they know their stuff, right? And so where we kind of went with that is, you know, we, had, we kind of started to differentiate over time, right? So we had the idea of team level skills, Agile at scale skills, and then transformational skills, okay? And, and even to this day, like depending upon like what level of coach we're hiring, like if we're looking for hard skills at the team level, you know, I wanna know things like, you know, can they, you know, do they know how to form a team? Do they know how to run ceremonies? Do they know how to like do burn downs and things like that? Can they work with a team to build backlogs? Um, can they do coaching? You know, maybe not like hardcore technical coaching, but can they talk about, the importance of continuous integration and continuous delivery and best practices around testing or writing acceptance criteria, things like that. And so when you get into Agile at scale, um, you're starting to think about how do I create networks of teams, right? How do I create um, maybe a program and portfolio layer? What do those teams look like? How do we, how do we govern decision-making? How do we align with like executive level strategy? How do we decompose work across multiple teams and manage dependencies? Um, what do we measure and control once we're outside of the team level? And, and what does that look like, right? So there's a whole different set of hard skills around Agile at scale. And then I would suggest that there's um, a different set of skills that you need when you're a, a transformation focused coach. And so I use a little bit of, of our lingo here, expeditions and base camps, but can you identify value streams? Can you decide how to break down the organization um, from big pieces into little pieces to lead them through? We use business capability modeling. So that's kind of like a hard skill um, at the transformation level. Do you understand business architecture? Do you understand how to align business architecture, technology architecture, organizational architecture? Um, do you understand how to um, establish intermediate goals in the transformation? Can you do change management, right? Things like that. So regardless, um, you know, that's definitely been an evolution for us as a company is, is what we're looking for in terms of hard skills. But hard skills, regardless of the level, team, scale, or transformation, that's really only one part of it. And, and this, the first four of these for us kind of evolved in a bit of a blob. Um, the skills part was like really, um, was really super obvious. But experience was another interesting thing, right? As you might imagine, you know, I don't, can't tell you how many resumes that we get where somebody says, I led the transformation um, at such and such a place. But what they really did is they participated in the transformation 
or maybe they'll say, I led the transformation at such and such a place. But what they really did is they went and they trained 2000 people on how to do scrum. Okay. And so, and so it's really difficult to decipher like what experiences are actually relevant for the kind of thing, the kind of um, role that you, you're going to, to put somebody into. And so, you know, so what we started kind of hunting for was, um, you know, again, it's kind of the same breakdown. Like what, what were the experiences we'd want to look for somebody who was going to be primarily team focused, right? So clearly that's practices and methodologies. You know, can you mentor? Can you facilitate? Um, are you a good, are you a front of the room coach? Are you a back of the room coach, right? That kind of a thing. Um, you know, maybe at the team level, there's some, you know, some simple process improvement kinds of things um, that you're looking for. Um, kind of funny, right? So as you start to get, what's, what's interesting about experiences and really skills is that as you kind of move up the stack, the, the lower parts of the stack become a little bit less important. So if I'm hiring somebody at a very senior level to, to lead transformation, I'm skewing way towards the right side of the slide than I am towards the left side. So we have some very senior transformation consultants in our organization that probably aren't the best people to sit down and write user stories. And so when I'm interviewing those guys, I'm interviewing them for, you know, candidly, have they had PNL responsibility somewhere? Because you know what the reality is, is that if you haven't had PNL responsibility, it's really difficult to sit down with the senior executive in a Fortune 10 company and have a credible conversation about their problems. Right. So if you've if you've walked in their shoes, that's like that's like a, a big thing. Right. Um, have they held those senior leadership roles? Can they can they um, demonstrate that level of empathy? Have they done transformation at executive level? Because sometimes there's a difference between just leading the transformation and being the person that does it. Kind of in the middle, a lot of the skills that we look for are um, oddly enough, right? And I know this is, I don't know if this is provocative to you guys, but like project management, portfolio management, have they dealt with in an organization the kinds of issues that middle managers um, in such and large enterprises are trying to deal with, right? So we hunted down knowledge first, right? And then we started trying to figure out how we were going to hunt down experience and then trying to figure out what experiences were applicable for the different levels that we were trying to put people into. So maybe like, tying this back to the theme of like how to become a great agile coach, right? You really have to understand, I believe, like what your aspirations are. Um, really, really common for us to have somebody that's super, super strong at the team level, but they think they're a transformation person, right? And so, and so understanding and being self-aware enough to understand that the skills and experiences that I have at the team level may or may not set me up for something with agile at scale because for me i don't know about you guys but to me agile at scale when i think of like safe or less or what have you disciplined agile delivery you might throw into that maybe some of shallowways stuff around flex right um when you start to think about the um agile at scale it it really becomes as much about coordinating and orchestrating the work of multiple teams rather than um single teams and the idea is, and you guys know this too, it's like, it's like there's so much organizational dysfunction and so many dependencies that have to be dealt with. It's like we can't pretend that those things don't exist, right? So Agile at scale becomes about how are we going to orchestrate the dependencies that exist. That's the large reason why SAFE exists. Um, LESS basically assumes that those dependencies are going to get removed at times, which kind of leads to the transformation stuff. It's like fundamentally how do we orchestrate so that we can decouple teams and actually have them be able to operate more independently over time. So, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about around the first two things. So, so then it got pretty clear, you know, when, when, you're, when you're young as a company, as we were, right? When you're young as a company, um, culture almost you get for free a little bit because you're hiring people you know, you're hiring people you like, you're hiring people that are a good fit. But one thing that I would suggest is that, is that as a coach, right, I have to make sure that I'm a good fit for the company that I choose to work for, but I also have to 
make sure that I'm a good fit culturally for the team that, that I'm going to work with as well. And so the things that we look for are things like, um, do you have humility? I think some of the stuff is, is fairly universal, but, but are you humble, right? Are you a learner? Are you seeking? Or do you think you have all the answers? Because that's one of the things that I think is really problematic with a lot of uh, the coaches that, that obviously like that we don't typically hire is that they think they've got all the answers. And if you can't come in with like a certain amount of humility and respect for the organization that you're coaching for, then that, that's super problematic to us hungry, right? You got to really deeply care. You got to want it, right? You've got to be, you got to be driven. You've got to engage. You've got to lean in. Um, people smart. Um, we're going to pack that. We're going to unpack that a little bit in some of the subsequent slides, but having um, awareness of the other um, and where they're at, having empathy for their current situation, having emotional intelligence so that you can, um, you can understand the things that are making them uncomfortable. You have to be able to be honest. You have to be able to be transparent. Sometimes people will challenge me, is there a difference between honesty and transparency? Like I can be super honest with you in the things that I tell you, um, but I also need to be transparent in that I'm telling you the things that you need to know. Um, as a leader in my organization, sometimes like I can be super honest, but I can't tell you everything, but I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I'm transparent about the things that are, that are absolutely appropriate. So when we're interviewing, like we really focus um, on those things. And then you start to get into other things that, um, that I think are super important around having a high degree of follow through, having a high degree of personal responsibility, commitment to client success, um, being operationally excellent and then being involved in the community, right? So, so that was like a handful. So when we built this slide, I, I reached out to Rachel, who's our chief cultural officer, and I was like, tell me the things that, that we're currently hiring for. And so, so I think the takeaway is, is as a coach, right, if you're trying to develop yourself to be a great coach, I think these are fantastic like general principles to apply, but it's really largely dependent upon the personality of your organization or the personality of the company or team um, that you're coaching for as well. And making sure that culture fit is there and like front and center is actually like a, a really, really big deal. Okay. Then the last little bit in this first section, and I was talking about how we've kind of evolved in phases um, as a company. So, you know, the first one being knowledge, um, the second one being experience, third one being culture. Um, one of the things that we looked for very early on, even though it was a bit of an evolution and still is, is are you a good community citizen? Like we want to know that you care and that you're actively involved, right? So um, are you a lifelong learner? Like, like we'll ask people questions like what books are they reading? How are they staying um, out in front of the industry? Are they listening to podcasts? Are they reading blogs? Are they, are they staying? Do they, do they have a, a history in the literature, like one of the things I think is super fascinating is I, I quote guys like Alistair Coburn and, um, you know, Kent Back and, you know, some of the, the early signers in the manifesto. It's amazing how many people um, at this stage of the game haven't gone backwards and read some of that foundational material. So I think part of being a great agile coach is understanding where, where all this stuff comes from. One of the big um, conversations that's going on right now, I just did a webinar um, an hour ago um, that we hosted around um, maintaining momentum in a distributed world. Um, because you know, we're all forced, forced, just like what we're doing right now, we're all forced into our houses because of the COVID crisis stuff, right? And so, and so we were talking about the idea of will distributed work, right? Is it the new normal? Well, what's interesting is that we can get the technology working Right. But even like in this particular context, um, you know, there's a there's a lack of depth and richness that we, it would be awesome to have if we were all face to face up in Raleigh. Right. We could talk after we could go have a drink um, during the, the real happy hour. Right. The, in that evening. Right. Um, but like one of the things that Alistair talks about is the idea of osmotic communication and how when we're all in the room together, you communicate for free. So like while we're making this work is it as rich as it would have been if we could have all gotten together, right? So understanding some of that underlying theory, um, I think is super important. 
I think the ability to get out and test your ideas in market is, and I say in market, right? And I've become a CEO, right? At this point, right? So I, I think in terms of markets and things like that, but, you know, getting out and putting your ideas out there. When I first started the Leading Agile blog, probably 15 years ago, um, I started the blog, not because I had answers. I started the blog because I had questions and I was asking questions and proposing answers. And I wanted to know what the community had to say about it, right? So if we show up and we think we have all the answers or, you know, maybe alternatively, we go to the guys that came before us, the Ken Schwavers, the Sutherlands, the Leffingwells, right? All that stuff, the Mike Cones, and we go, we're just gonna tuck up underneath your thought leadership, right? That's okay to a point, right? But I don't think that makes you great. What I think makes you great is when you're pushing the boundaries and trying new things. So it is the line of the manifesto. Like we're basically like we're learning by doing, we're trying new things and we're exploring and we're seeing what works. And, and I think that's the disposition of a coach. There's been tons of times when I've been sitting in front of a client and I go, you know, guys, I think this is the way that this needs to work for you guys. And they go, well, it won't work here because of X, Y, Z. And is that a dead end or is that an opportunity? You know, are we going to say, okay, let's put together a creative solution and let's try something. Let's run an experiment. Let's see how it works. Let's get the feedback, you know, and then maybe in three or four months, if it didn't work the way we expected, we'll have a pretty good idea why and be able to pivot. But if we're just anchored into what we know, then we kind of become a one trick pony, right? We don't have the ability to pivot outside of our domain knowledge into other more creative solutions that, that could benefit our clients. So I think having that, that basis in the literature, right? Having that, that community connection and being willing to ask tough questions, I think is like a really, really big deal. Um, one of the things that we ask, especially some of our younger coaches to do is to get out and volunteer a lot, you know? And so like, I wanna see people out there that are so passionate about this that they're running local user groups or, or they're setting up virtual communities or, or they're doing something, right? Um, showing up at the big Agile Alliance conference in October and or I guess not October, I don't know where I got that, um, in uh, July or whatever it is, and, uh, and they're volunteering, right? I think that's kind of what, what, what um, you know, it makes you a contributor to this thing that we're building. So this would be like, I, I'll pause for a second. Are there, any, are there any questions coming up or anything? Mike, we do have one from yeah. Corey. Uh, interested in where you see a dividing line between resistance you can overcome and resistance you can't. What things do you see that let you know your efforts are not wasted? Well, well, so so an interesting thing. So one of the, the disposition, and, and this is a hard question sometimes to answer because the disposition that we've taken in market is we try to educate, 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 educate because like when people hire us, we want them to be ready to do the things that we want them to do. Um, if I were a coach in a company and I got just hired to be an agile coach and I was trying to manage up from that position, it's a really tough place to be in. Right. And so <clears throat> I can answer it from both directions. And it get, the first part from my perspective is like, well, that sounds great, Mike, but we can't do that here. You know, I tend to take a disposition of like, OK, well, I have a hypothesis. This is where I think it'll go. Let's run an experiment. Let's give it a shot. Right. That kind of a thing. Um, sometimes if I'm if I'm a coach um, in a company, it's just a, that's a harder conversation, right? Because you're trying to influence so far up the stack and there's so many things that are beyond your control, right? So, so in a company, I think it's a, it's a different answer. And, and I think sometimes, and I, I don't know that I want to recommend this, but I think sometimes what you have to do is yeah, it's almost like you have to like act, act locally and think globally. You almost have to like figure out how to improve what you have agency to improve and then use that success to expand out. There's been a whole like conversation for the last 20 years that we've been doing this around grassroots, right? And the hypothesis around grassroots is if we have local success, that will spin up. Now I'm like a huge Stephen Covey guy, right? So I, I totally believe in like circle of influence, circle of concern. So I'm gonna operate within my circle of influence and I'm gonna try to expand it. I'm gonna be great where I have control or influence and then as I become great and demonstrate results, I would like to think that that influence could expand. We have this little thing in Leading Agile we call the trust influence loop. And the trust side is all about 
like calling your shots. Like I said, I was going to do this. This was the outcome. I can measure it. It was great. And then I can use the success on the trust side to influence the organization more broadly. In an ideal world, you have top down alignment from a vision perspective and you have bottom up trust and influence stuff going on all the time. I think that the, the struggle and what I hear underneath that question is what if I'm a coach on the ground and I don't have alignment up here? The only thematic answer that I can give you is that, is that, um, is that by doing great work here, you have a shot at, at communicating up and influencing up. But I think it's a, I think honestly, it's a daisy game, right? I don't know that there's a quick, like, like back of the envelope answer for that one, right? Okay, cool. I, we've got one more question here. As yeah, a scrum master with a desire to become an agile coach, how yeah. would you recommend pursuing all the experience and training you've talked about? Yeah, how do you recommend pursuing it? Um, you know, so back in the day, right, I can tell you my personal story. Um, I'm very, I'm also very much like a, like a Christopher Avery guy, right? So I'm very much like personal responsibility. And, and I happen to be very driven, as you might manage, as you might imagine. And so if I was a scrum master operating at that level, like it, it's a little bit of a combination of, of what I'm getting ready to say and the answer I just gave. It's like I would read every single thing at my disposal. I would, I would push, you know, I'm not like a huge safe guy, but there's a lot of value in what Dean's doing with safe. I would go get safe certification if I could. I would go get less certification if I could get it paid for. Um, I would absolutely go spend $30 on every single book that I could possibly read. My sister asked me one time, my sister's my director of finance, by the way, but my sister asked me one time, she's like, she's like, how did you learn all this stuff? Like, how did you become Mike Kottmeyer, right? Running, leading agile when there's no college degree, there's no course, there's no whatever. And the answer is I read everything, everything, right? And then I tested my, all the things we just talked about, I tested my ideas in market and I wrote about them and I synthesized and I wrote papers and I did talks and presentations and year after year after year after year, I honed it, right? So the first answer is read everything and write, okay? Certification's cool right? But read everything you can, write, develop a point of view. And this is what I found is if your point of view resonates, if you have empathy for your audience, like one of the things that I started writing about really early was like, why do executives care about this stuff? Like, I'll tell you, this is another thing that, that I think limits the influence of most, most coaches. And, and we've done this to ourselves. It's like, we are so focused on improving the lives of teams we forget about improving the lives of our executives, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. There is a lot to be said for improving the lives of teams, but there's this interesting thing. It's like if we start with the teams, we wanna say, trust us to the executives, you're gonna get what you want. Maybe, maybe not, right? Depends on how broken the system is. If we can somehow align what it is that we are trying to do with like the executives understanding of their goals, Right. A lot of times we have this tendency to want to hypothesize on what we think the problems that the executives have are, but we don't necessarily understand it in their language. I will tell you, so I've had a, you know, it's interesting. I would have never been a CEO in a company had I not started my own company. I want to be like super, super clear on that. No way I would have navigated the politics of an organization up. So, so, but I will tell you having, having sat in this seat as an entrepreneur and we're leading agile, we're, we're about $40 million company. We're like 120 people. We, we're, we're not a small business anymore, like a medium sized business. And um, I will tell you most days, people that talk to me, do not understand at all what my day is like. They don't understand my problems. They don't understand my concerns. Like so much of what I'm dealing with, especially in this COVID crisis is um, maintaining cash reserves, maintaining the ability to make payroll, making sure that we're providing excellent uh, coverage for our clients, um, making sure business continuity, finance, marketing. I mean, it's crazy. I've got a set of concerns that are really, really different than what my coaches on the ground are dealing with. And if somebody comes up to me and says, well, I've got this great idea for like how we could coach better or how we could do something in the community of practice better or how we do something in one of our pods better. It's like, I'm like, cool, but not fundamentally my problem. I care, but I only care tangentially. 
So as you're developing, like one of the biggest things, you have to widen the aperture of the things that you see are as important. And, and, and here I think is the catch 22. And then I, and I want to move on to the next section. The catch 22 is like, well, how do I understand the needs of executives if executives aren't sitting down and talking to me about it? And a big part of that is read executive books, read the books that executives are reading and learn how to care about what they care about. Um, candidly, I capped out in my corporate career and, and like I can, like I can spin it nice. I can say I was a program manager or a portfolio manager or whatever. I reported to VP or whatever. I was a project manager, right? I capped out my professional career as a project manager. I have never sat in an executive seat, never, right? I started this company selling to executives, never having sat in an executive seat. Um, but I went to school on what those guys cared about because in my seat, right? I'm running a company. Those are the guys that have money to hire me. You know, candidly, you know, um, agile coaches tend not to, right? So I had to care about what they care about. But if you guys take that into your world and you're like, I want to influence executives, because that's what I'm doing. I'm influencing them, right? If you want to influence them, you have to deeply show how what you're doing is the most important thing to them and get them to pay attention, right? Um, there's a part of me that wants to go back and apologize that my 15, you know, 15 year younger me wants to go back and apologize to every executive I ever worked for because all these things I'm telling you to do, like I didn't, right? It took me 15, 20 years of doing this to like, to get to that point of understanding. And I had a lot of awkward conversations and I walked into offices of people that potentially could have bought from me and they didn't because like, I just didn't tell them the right story. One guy asked me one time as fast as the first time I tried to sell something that was like six figures. And he goes, well, he goes in three or four months after you're gone, how will I know you have been here? I'm like, that's a really fascinating question, right? Well, you'll know how to do scrum or you'll know how to do a good daily standup. It's not worth a hundred thousand dollars. You know what I mean? I can go Google that. Right. And so, so you just have to be really clear, right. On, on what your value prop is and, and how you're helping that executive because it's only when you connect to their problem that you're truly influential, okay? Now here's another angle, and this is, this is like a self-awareness thing for you guys, right? And, and where this impacted us, and this is the reason why it's in my slide deck, is we were hiring people that would come in and say, Mike, I've been following your stuff forever, and I think you guys are super smart, I love working, I wanna work for you, and you know, we'd be like, oh, that's awesome. They think our stuff's smart. And we get on an interview and we tell them all about our stuff and they go, yeah, 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 yeah. That's excellent. I want to be a part of that. But what would happen is that we would find out is that fundamentally, like the, in the language we started to use was like, what is somebody's home base? <clears throat> and, and so we put together this little grid. And so on the vertical axis, we have teams on one side and we have enterprise on the other. On the horizontal axis have people and business. <clears throat> and so we kind of started thinking about people, and there's no value judgment around this, there's no good or no bad, it's just a self-awareness thing, is that there are a class of people that I would call small team people focused. And, and I'm gonna say this about this person because I've had this conversation with her, but like Lisa Atkins, right? Love Lisa Atkins, awesome human being, super smart, brilliant coach, we've co-presented before, love this lady. She's a small team people focused coach, right? She loves humans right? She loves working with humans on a deep personal level and helping their lives be better, right? There is a place for that in this world, right? Um, on the other end of the spectrum might be like enterprise focused, business oriented coaches. That tends to be where leading agile falls, right? So we're working with hyper large organizations. It's all about business metrics and performance. Um, you know, you, if you listen to my talks, I'm talking about um, how do you measure transformation performance? How do you try to tie to strategic objectives? We're talking about KPIs and OKRs and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, well, where's all the people stuff? Well, it's there, but it's in this other quadrant and it's not usually the people that we're selling to, right? That kind of a thing. And then, then there's kind of hybrids of it, right? So you have what you would call like people focused enterprise people. I kind of tend to think of like um, Dan Mezik, if you guys know Dan, um, in that category. 
So, you know, Dan's hype market hypothesis is like, we're gonna, we're gonna bring everybody into a room and we're gonna do like open space. I don't wanna mischaracterize his stuff, so I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about Dan, but, but Dan's like super genuine and super passionate about um, the people-focused enterprise stuff. And then on the other side, you might have like somebody who's more of a team-focused coach, but they're more focused on the metrics and, and you know, burn downs and story points and, and things like that. Right. So the world is, is full of people. Right. And and all of those different perspectives um, kind of contribute to this tapestry of coaching and and coaches. We need all of those kinds of coaches. The, the challenge is, is that is that you have to be a fit for the organization that you're in. So like we've had experiences where like maybe somebody who's like a big team people focused coach is working with an organization that largely wants to take a big team business focused approach. There's going to be a, a, a gap between the perspectives of those people, right? So maybe to some of the earlier questions, right? The one question that somebody asked me around, like how do I influence? So like imagine this challenge, you're a small team people focused coach who's going and working with the CIO of an auto manufacturer that is, comes out of the whole dimming world, throughput, theory constraints, you know, cost accounting versus throughput accounting. It's all about metrics and cycle time and all this stuff, right? And you're kind of hypothesizing that, well, if we just create more collaborative environments and empower our people, then you're going to get all that throughput stuff. They might listen for a bit, but at some point they're going to want to know how. Like, how, how is that actually going to happen? Well, trust your people and it will happen. That's usually not a strong answer for those guys, right? And so we would have people come in and, 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 and start to work with us, and they, would, they, they could learn our stuff, <clears throat> and they could learn our kind of big team business-focused stuff, but then under pressure, like if they had like a really intense CIO that was just like asking them tough stuff, they would go to their small team people-focused home base, right? So we started trying to figure out what people's home bases were because I wanted to kind of know under pressure, where is this person's default answer going to be, right? No value judgment, no right or wrong. It's just, if you want to be great, you have to understand who you are and what you value. And I would suggest align yourself with an organization that shares your values. So there's tons of space in this world for people that are small team people focused coaches right? There just are, right? But maybe not in every company, right? And if that's what you want to be, a small team, people-focused coach, and you're working in a company that wants big team, business-focused agile, that might be why it's hard to be influential with them, you know, because your value systems are, are misaligned. That was a big topic. So I'm going to pause for that. Did any questions come through? Anybody want to ask a question before I move on? The only question I'm seeing right now, Mike, okay. is, uh, is there any one resource you might recommend to keep your finger on the pulse of what execs care about? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm going to be, I'm going to sound really cynical here a little bit, but mostly it's about revenue. Like, I hate to say that, but it's like, like one of the things that I talk about, and, and again, right, 120 people way smaller than some of these organizations that we work with. Um, it's, it's like, like I have to, I have to preface like, so like I deeply, deeply care about my people and I deeply care about our methodology and our approach and how we contribute to market and, and how we do all these different things. Like I'm, like, I hope you guys know, like I'm passionate about that, but on the flip side, and, and this crisis is like totally, um, like we can go four months with no revenue with, and not lay anybody off. Right. And that's like a great place to be because that's enough time. But it's like if we hadn't been focused on profitability and accumulating cash and being really careful and managing SGNA and blah, 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 blah. Right. We wouldn't be in a position to protect our people and to continue our work. I had a lady who worked for me as our um, chief operating officer for a little bit. And I was going through I had a period probably in the middle of the company where I was like learning how to be a CEO and like literally was losing my mind almost every day. And she would go like, she'd go like, Mike, you're going to kill our culture if you don't stop being such a jerk. And she was a little more colorful than that, but that was kind of what she said. And I went, well, I said, if we don't get these problems fixed, we're not going to have a culture to protect. 
right? So it's like all the stuff I care about, but if we're not economically sound, then, then it's really hard to get my attention, right, on a lot of things. And so I would start with the assumption that, that basically the company cares about delivering value being economically sound. Like that would be, that would be my guess, right? Um, you know, and then outside of that, it cascades, right? So it's organizational structure, organizational design, how are we aligning business capability? Like there's a bunch of stuff that cascades from that. But maybe to answer your question more directly, um, you know, read the things they read. Pay attention to Harvard Business Review. Pay attention to CIO Magazine. Pay attention to, um, if you have access to Gardner reports, um, pay attention to what Gardner has to say about stuff. Um, you know, you can, you can derive a lot about um, what those guys care about from, from the information that they read. Okay. Did I see another question come through, Steve? That's the only one that's in there right now, Mike. Okay, cool. What time are we supposed to wrap up? Just so I can time myself out here. We have about 10 minutes left. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Okay, so this one's, this one's a little bit hard to explain. And so I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to go super deep into it. But one of the things that we started doing is so we had gotten through the skills experience, all that kind of stuff. We started getting into the core beliefs. And then we started trying to identify behaviors. And so um, this is a hard one to tell you how to improve, but again, it's a, it's a level of self-awareness. We, we use an instrument called people DNA. Um, you know, you can derive some of the stuff out of DISC, you can derive some of the stuff out of Myers-Briggs, um, but understanding who you are as a person. And so we have this profile mix, if you can see, I actually have some notes that, that Rachel sent to me from this. So like the creator profile is like, they're, they're fundamentally change agents, where like maybe a, an improver is in good at working within existing systems, an implementer is good at taking ideas and turning them into reality. Um, what we've found is that through time is that people that are, um, are change agents, the ones that come up with big ideas, solve problems, have breakthroughs. What we started to do is we started to, to personality assess people and then compare the profiles of the people that we thought were excelling in certain areas. And we started creating these profiles around them. So largely like a, a leading agile person is largely fits like a creator profile. A persuader is somebody who is influential and good at getting people bought into their ideas and their way of thinking. Ego style, inner confidence, um, highly self-confident. Like there are some attributes underneath this that have to do with like resilience and recovery time. Like if you get your feelings hurt, like if you put your idea out, you get a feelings hurt kind of a thing. Um, really difficult to be an agile coach or a change agent because if you're constantly worried about how other people receive you or if they don't like your idea, if that hurts your feelings, it's really a tough place to be. You got to make sure that you're really um, aligned with that organization. And then um, this idea of like selective and prioritized, you've got to be able to like maintain a list, but make like good judgments in terms of like what to do. So we started going through and like, so one of the things we do is we personality profile people and we compare them against like different um, internal profiles. And we've actually used this as a bit of a coaching model internally if somebody's struggling to say like, hey, can you try to see if you can, you know, you know, tweak this aspect of your personality to make you more effective. And the one that always sticks in my head is, do you get your feelings hurt and does it take you a long time to get over it? Because that's just like a really, really tough profile, especially as somebody who's a consultant. Might be able to get away with a little bit if you're a permanent employee, but I, I would suggest not even in that, right? So if you guys want, um, since I'm running out of time here a little bit, um, if you guys want any information on the assessment tools that we use, um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to probably have Rachel candidly contact you and, and, and walk you through some of that stuff and give you some information on it. Um, but the idea of making sure that your, per, your default personality is a good fit for the organization you're in. There's another thing that we look at. Um, it's a tool that it's not in the slide deck. It's called color code. Um, it's absolutely revolutionized my understanding of human behavior, and it's really super simple. It's very similar to, to DISC, but I think more clear, colorcode.com if you want more information. And it measures you on whether you're primarily emotional or logical, controlling or non-controlling. And so like everybody's like a spectrum, like most everybody has all four of the colors. My wife is actually only two of the colors. She's emotionally controlling, logically non-controlling. I'm almost only two of the colors. I'm logically controlling, emotionally non-controlling, 
right? So there's like this whole personality dynamic. And what we find, which is really fascinating, is because in, this, in the color code on this red-yellow profile, logically controlling, emotionally non-controlling, I have built largely a red-yellow company. Right? Our style, our approach to coaching, our approach to the market, our approach to storytelling is largely red-yellow. And so red-yellow coaches tend to work better for us. Right? Um, blue, we have some blue-white coaches, some yellow-white coaches, some red-blue coaches right, that are different mixes of these things. And so what we look for is if you have a different default personality style, how are you going to um, how do you adjust your behavior to adapt to the world that you live in? Which kind of largely brings me to my next piece <clears throat> is this idea of emotional intelligence. This was kind of the third phase of us trying to figure some of this stuff out, right? And so what we found is that, and the cool thing about emotional intelligence, which I'll start, is that emotional intelligence is stuff that you can actually learn to do better. Right. And you could go read Daniel Goleman's work on emotional and social intelligence. There's tons of HBR stuff on developing emotional intelligence. Um, this would probably be the number one thing, aside from skills and experience. If you want to be a great agile coach, go work on your emotional intelligence. And let me tell you why I think this is so important. Twofold. So when we first started it, what we recognized was that if I can sit in a room with somebody and understand if I'm making them uncomfortable, I have the opportunity to pivot, right? Because sometimes ideas make people uncomfortable. We are fundamentally, regardless of what level we're operating at, we are in the change business. Changing um, people or the environments they work in makes people uncomfortable. If you can have enough awareness of that other person's emotional state, it gives you the opportunity to respond. What we also find is that people with really high emotional intelligence, and we actually have emotional intelligence minimums on a tool called EQI that we, we measure people on. Um, we won't hire people with less than like a 110 score or something like that. Um, so, so if you want to have higher emotional intelligence, you can develop it. It gives you the ability to read other people. But here's the also the thing. It also makes you aware of yourself. And here's the cool thing. So if somebody doesn't match us perfectly from like, a, from like a, a personality profiling perspective, but they have really, really high emotional intelligence, what that can tell us is that they're self-aware enough that they can develop um, compensating behaviors to overcome some of their mismatches. It's fascinating, right? So emotional intelligence is the number one thing that I would say go do work on, right? Because the more emotionally intelligent you are, we are, like I said, we are in the people and connecting business. So, so developing that ability to understand the other is huge, right? And so I'm going to give you another idea that's like really close. And you guys don't have any control over this one, but, but here's like an interesting, we use a tool called um, CCAT and it does kind of like a rough um, correlation to like a, to like a intellectual intelligence. And this is what I think is like the secret sauce of a really, really solid agile coach. If I, can, if I can read that you're uncomfortable and I am quick enough, I'm a quick enough thinker to, um, to adapt my ideas on the fly, I don't get my feelings hurt, going back to the behavior stuff, and I've got enough foundational knowledge and experience and that thought leadership and that history of inventing that I can invent things dynamically to try, that to me, I think is great. Okay. So the, the portrait that we're trying to paint of people is, um, do you have the right behaviors? Do you have the right knowledge, the experience, right? All that stuff. And then can I tell, can I read the other person and can I adapt to them fast enough to be credible in the room? Right. And so maybe because, especially because of this one, right? Because now let me tell you where, where I think um, the ability to think fast um, goes wrong sometimes is, is there's a lot of really, really smart people out there that don't adapt and combine ideas really fast. And so, so like we have a developer on our staff that has a really low CCAT score, relatively low CCAT score. Um, super smart, brilliant guy. Right. I mean, he does great work with me as his product owner, builds software like a madman, super smart guy. 
my hypothesis is, is if you take him out of his core problem domain, the things he really deeply understands, he's not going to pivot quite as fast. And that's what we see sometimes where it's like people will tend to get anchored on like, this is the way I know how to do it. And they're, they're because of their behavior profiles or emotional intelligence, whatever, they don't pivot easily, right? They can't synthesize information easily. And you guys know this as much as anybody. You're sitting in front of that room. You're trying to be influential. You're trying to get that executive to understand what you're saying. And, and if you're sitting in front of them and you can't read their discomfort, pivot dynamically, and then be able to um, adapt your message to them, really, really difficult to influence. One of the tricks that, that I've started to use um, over time is like, I never walk in and say anything without asking probably five or six questions first. And so like, I'll go in and ask a bunch of questions because I want to understand what they're thinking. And then I start, based upon what they've told me, I start teaching them a little bit, and then I try to get them to ask me questions. And when they ask me questions, then I can coach them some, right? So there's some tools and techniques to kind of ease into this, but coming in hot with a really solid point of view before you really understand the other person can get you into a lot of trouble, right? Thinking that you have the right answer and you, or maybe that you have the only answer can get you into a lot of trouble with executives. And so now I'm going to go into a couple things that are just a little bit, um, a little bit hard to explain. And I'm telling you, we don't have them totally figured out yet, but there's like something there that we're hunting and I'm going to see if I can try to explain it to you. This picture probably makes no sense unless you happen to know what a stereogram is. Has anybody ever heard? Well, I guess you guys can't really answer me. So there's this idea of a stereogram <clears throat> where if you stared at this thing long enough, an image would emerge out of it. Okay. And in this particular case, it's a hammer and a nail. And I promise you, you stare at it long enough, you'll see the hammer and the nail. We used this at one of our co company gatherings four or five years ago for me to try to explain. And this is where it gets into like, this is like transformational stuff, right? So there's some experience in this, there's some knowledge in it, there's a lot of different things in it. But what we have to be aware of is that when we walk into a really complex, messed up kind of organization, and we're trying to introduce Agile, what we have to be able to figure out if we wanna lead that company forward is what is the organized non-chaotic pattern in the chaos? There is a pattern in this chaos on the screen that nobody can see. You might be the only person that can actually see it. Like, I don't know if any of you guys know Dennis Stevens, but Dennis Stevens is my chief methodologist, good friend, co-founder of Leading Agile. We've been working together for about, since longer than Leading Agile has existed. Um, probably the smartest guy I know. That guy can see order in chaos like nobody else, right? Like nobody else. And again, it's experience, it's knowledge, understanding, it's all those different things. But the one thing I want to challenge you guys to think about, <clears throat> and I don't know how to tell you how to do it, and that's, and that's why, I, but I want you to be aware of it, <clears throat> is that any organization, there is an organized pattern that we have to figure out how to see. And, and, it's, and it's tough, right? Because now what we have to do as change agents, as leaders, right, as transformational leaders more so than just coaches, is that we have to understand what that pattern looks like and we have to help other people see it, right? And the final point that I'll make, um, maybe not second to the second to last point I'll make, is that um, the ability to see how when you make one change over here, it impacts the whole entire rest of the system is another thing, right? So books that I might read, um, like Peter Senge's Fifth Discipline, um, Eli Goldratt's The Goal. Those are like the two that are like top of mind for me. Anything around systems thinking. Um, there was, um, I'm, sure I'm going to start misquoting books if I, if I keep going on this path. But the idea of being able to, to think outside of the one thing that you're doing. Al Shalloway wrote a, wrote a great article four or five years ago around why um, pilots fail. Right. And pilots a lot of times fail. I actually took some of that core thinking. It was in alignment with my thinking and did the initial talk that I did six, seven, five, six years ago, whenever called why agile fails. And the idea is, is that, is that when you create a scrum team in the middle of all this chaos, you can make scrum work, no doubt. But the problem is, is when that team goes back into the rest of the ecosystem, how does it disrupt the rest of the ecosystem or how does the rest of the ecosystem respond to it? Right, so a lot of times what you have to do is you have to figure out how to form pilots and how to make initial steps 
understanding that anything you do is going to jack up the rest of the ecosystem while you're doing it. Right. And so again, I don't have the ability, like right now I don't have the ability to test for it and I don't know that I have the ability to teach for it. But what I do have the ability to do is to make people aware of the consequences of not seeing it. Right. So just know that when we walk in hot and heavy and we're like scrum, 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 or safe, 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 or whatever. And we think we have the way guarantee that there are collateral impacts. And if nothing else, what you guys have to do is you have to slow down enough to understand how, what this thing I'm doing here, how it's going to impact the rest of it. And so the actual last point is that these are roles that we have at leading agile. We call, we talk about, you know, we have agile process coaches, we have technical coaches, we have really junior people we call analysts, um, more senior people um, like uh, program and portfolio coaches. Sometimes we call them integration coaches that are operating at the program and portfolio layers and managing value through that. Um, expedition leads are the ones that are actually managing the transformation work on the ground. Transformation leads are, are typically have PNL responsibility and they're like executive level transformation coaches. And there's, there's a role for all of those different kinds of coaches. So the trick that you guys have to understand to really be great is what are you aspiring to? What do you want? What kind of impact do you want to have in your organization? And then you have to ask yourself, who do I need to be as a coach to be able to do that? If you want to do small team people focused stuff, right? And you know the heck out of Scrum and maybe you know some safe stuff, right? You can do agile process coaching, maybe some program portfolio coaching all day long. Just know that when you get up and you start leading transformations or creating space or wanting to influence executives, there's like a whole nother perspective of things that you have to take into consideration. And again, like the number one thing I could say, and I, I've been saying this to my team for years, read and write, right? Read and write, read and write, read and write. Read everything that you can read and write about it and explore and get feedback. And I think that's how you learn, right? Because again, right, there's no course curriculums on this stuff. There's no college degrees in it, right? No certification that's really teaching you how to do this. So it's like you just have to inform the heck out of yourself and develop yourself and then the emotional intelligence stuff. So I'll pause with that. Any, uh, any final questions before we get out of here? No? There's nothing in the chat window right now, Mike. Well, cool. So Mike at leadingagile.com, feel free to email me, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm super happy to answer follow-on questions. Um, happy to support you however I can support you. And finally, if you want the deck, um, text that number to text 10 steps of that number and it'll get it to you instantly. So awesome. Hey, thanks for having me guys. I really Mike, appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Mike, thank you so much for presenting. Appreciate it. And folks, yeah. thank you for attending. Uh, please remember to go to SCED and provide feedback. Feedback is a gift, as you know. Um, we want to be able to give that to Mike. So please do provide some feedback on the session and remember to keep the conversation going in the Slack channel. Awesome guys. Thank Thanks you. So much. Everyone. Enjoy the rest of your conference. See you later. Bye-bye.